Tennessee Across the plains of Texas From sea to shining sea From Detroit down to Houston And New York to L.A. Where there's pride in every American heart And it's time we stand and say with so many proud American patriots who believe in God, family, and country. Thank you very much. This is a great group of people. And I want to thank a man of incredible commitment, vision, and devotion, Ralph Reed. And Ralph, I want to wish you a very happy birthday. Very, very, very interesting day to have a birthday, because a big decision came down one year ago today. So that's very, very interesting. That's very interesting, Ralph. Let me also recognize Faith and Freedom Coalition Executive Director Tim Head. Tim, thank you very much. Tim, where are you, my dear? Thank you, Tim. Great job. As well as Senator Lindsey Graham. Lindsey, thank you very much. He's gotten very much more conservative, I have to tell you. Carrie Lake. Frank Pavone. Frank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And congratulations as well to Richard Vigory on receiving the Defender of Freedom Award, a big deal, and to Mike Huckabee, my friend, for a long time, long, long time, getting the Lifetime Achievement Award. I think he's better now than he was 20 years ago. You want to know this? I heard what he had to say, but... He is not a good example of it. You're in great shape. Thanks, Mike. And thanks for being a friend. I also want to thank a great politician and a fantastic person running for governor of North Carolina. His endorsement yesterday was amazing. Right? From North Carolina. Lieutenant Governor Mark Robinson. That was such an endorsement, it went viral. It was all over the world last night. I think he's going to do quite well. These young ladies followed me. I guess we have, what, 99th? This is your 99th event. And they're from North Carolina, and they're incredible, and they're beautiful, and they happen to be rich, I think. But they're great, and he's going to do very well, Mark, I think, in North Carolina. Last but not least, let me say a very special thanks to all of you that are gathered here, the crowd is incredible. And even outside, it's packed. So something's going on. We do have great poll numbers, you know. We just got some poll numbers. 77 to 23. That was good. We're going to win this. That was good. That's against the Republicans and beating Biden by 11. 
You say, why only 11? How can he possibly do so well? But it's a real mess. Our country's in a horrible situation. Since 2016, Faith and Freedom Coalition volunteers have knocked on 17.8 million doors, reached over 30 million Christian voters in their homes. And last year alone, you reached another 30 million voters in their churches. Incredible job that Ralph and the group do. No group has fought harder in defense of the Judeo-Christian values that we all stand for and uphold, and no group will be more crucial to our magnificent victory on Election Day 2024. So important. That'll be the most important election we've ever had. I said it with 2016, but I say it with 2024. I think even more strongly going to be the most important election this country has ever had, because our country is going to hell. With your help, we're going to evict crooked Joe Biden from the White House. And we're going to take back our country, and we're going to make America great again. For seven years, you and I have been fighting side by side to rescue our country from evil and from the sinister forces who hate it. I believe they hate it, and I believe they actually want to destroy it. Now we're approaching the most important battle of our lives. As we gather today, our beloved nation is teetering on the edge of tyranny. I believe that, and you believe that. Our enemies are waging war on faith and freedom, on science and religion, on history and tradition, on law and democracy, on God Almighty himself. They are waging war. That's not a war they're going to win. The radicals are setting fire to our Constitution abolishing free speech, attacking religious belief, erasing our borders, corrupting our elections, and we have corrupt elections, and trying to impose their blasphemous creed and woke communism on every American man, woman, and child. And that's what they're doing, and they're trying so hard. We've never had a situation like is going on right now in our country. But the people in this room will never let them do it. They'll never let them get away with it, and it's not going to happen. We will not waver in defense of our faith, our freedom, and our great American flag. They don't want the flag either. They don't want anything. They don't want anything that's good. And you wonder why and how did they ever get elected in the first place. It's sick. Together, we're warriors in a righteous crusade to stop the arsonists, the atheists, globalists, and the Marxists, and that's what they are. And we will restore our republic as one nation under God with liberty and justice for all. The menacing specter of left-wing repression has been growing steadily for years and years. It's been growing, and we were stopping it very powerfully for four years, and now it's picked up at a level that nobody's ever seen before. First, they slandered Americans of faith as haters and bigots. Then they corrupted the media. They installed radical left judges to subvert our Constitution. They used the IRS to target conservatives. They spied on our campaign, and specifically, they spied on my campaign. And we caught them. They're terrible. Nobody would have thought. Could you imagine if it was the other way? Could you imagine if, let's say, I spied? Let's not use Biden. Let's use Obama. Let's say, Mike Huckabee, that you and I spied on Obama's campaign. Do you think it would have been fine? You know, this would be, we'd be away for a long time, wouldn't we, huh? They tried to take down a presidency with hoaxes and witch hunts. They're still trying, but we wouldn't let them. And now Joe Biden has weaponized law enforcement to interfere in our elections, the greatest abuse of power that I've seen and that most of you have seen in the history of our country. It's a hoax. Every time the radical left Democrats, Marxists, communists, and fascists indict me, I consider it a great badge of courage. I'm being indicted for you, and I believe the you is more than 200 million people that love our country. They're out there and they love our country. This is a continuation of the greatest witch hunt of all time. 
which has been fully exposed in the Durham report, the IG report by Inspector General Horowitz did a great job on that report, and by great writers, journalists, and pundits all over the world. And its primary purpose is exactly that, election interference. They want to interfere with the upcoming election. They want to demean, insult, do whatever is necessary to interfere. And as you know, the fake news doesn't report on all of the things that you're reading about and hearing about. You're hearing about things that you can't believe, bigger than Watergate, bigger than anything we've ever seen. And if you look at the New York Times, or if you look at the Washington Post, or the mainstream media of any kind, ABC, NBC, CBS, not a word of it, not a word, not even a little bit. They want to interfere with the fair and free election to a point where Joe Biden is willing to arrest his opponent, who is leading him in the polls by a very, very large number. They lie, they cheat, and they steal. And this is how low they fall in an attempt to win the 2024 election. And we're not going to let that happen. We're not letting it happen. They rigged the presidential election of 2020. We are not going to allow to, we are just not going to allow them to rig the presidential election of 2024. Not going to happen. Charging a former president who did a good job. We had a lot of people that were very happy. There are some people said it was the most consequential presidency. But charging a former president of the United States under the Espionage Act of 1917, that's like making nuclear weapons in your basement, isn't it? <laughs> An act for a crime so heinous that only the death penalty would do is one of the most outrageous and vicious legal theories ever put forward in an American court of law. It's a disgrace. And the people they have doing it are disgraceful. And just look at their record. Disgraceful. The Espionage Act has been used to go after traitors and spies. It has nothing to do with a former president legally keeping his own documents. As a president, the law that applies to this case is not the Espionage Act, as the lawyers will tell you, and they like to tell you, and the press doesn't like to write about it, but the courts of law will see it, and they already know it. But the Presidential Records Act, which is not even mentioned in this ridiculous 44-page, 44 44-page 44 indictment of me. I didn't know about that. You know, when I graduated from the Wharton School of Finance, we didn't study being indicted, getting arrested, <laughs> going to jail. We didn't know about that. They never taught us that. Under the Presidential Records Act, which is civil, not criminal, done in 1977, civil, I had every right to have these documents, personal belongings, and boxes. Joe Biden didn't. Even Mike Pence didn't have that right. They weren't covered by the Presidential Records Act. I was because I was president, but they weren't. But these scoundrels and thugs, they only come after me. They didn't go after the many, many other presidents that kept their documents. You know about it. Many, many others. If you look at the Bush family, if you look at even Jimmy Carter, and I'd say he's innocent. I say Jimmy Carter's innocent. But they went after me. They didn't go after anybody else. And they went after me criminally. And it's not a criminal violation. It's not even a violation under the Presidential Records Act. And what could be more accurate a statement than Presidential Records Act? That's what we're talking about. <laughs> not espionage. It's not espionage. The crucial legal precedent is laid out in the most important case ever on the subject known as the Clinton Sox case. You know what that means, Sox? <laughs> Let me give you a hint. It has something to do with socks and taking things out in your socks. After leaving the White House, Bill Clinton kept 79 audio tapes in his socks and his sock drawer. So he put them in his sock. I didn't. I put mine in boxes outside of the White House, and the GSA picked them up and delivered them where they were supposed to be delivered. But they included in the Clinton discussions and the Clinton tapes a discussion of U.S. military involvement in Haiti. He can't get away from Haiti, can he? Right? He's done very well with Haiti. Discussions of U.S. foreign policy, both defense and offense, against Cuba. And what about them allowing China to have military bases now in Cuba? I think uh, you're not too happy about that, Mr. Senator. And he's not even saying anything about it. 
recording of President Clinton's conversations with foreign leaders, sensitive facts about trade negotiations taken from presidential briefings. This is all in the tapes. Discussions with Secretary of State about conflict in Bosnia and much, much more. Not only was Bill Clinton never even considered for criminal prosecution based on the tapes he took, and these are tapes he took. These were serious tapes. But when he was sued for them, he won the case. He won it. Judge Amy Berman Jackson's decision states, under the statutory scheme established by the Presidential Records Act, the decision to segregate personal materials from presidential records is made by the president during the president's term and in his sole discretion. Now, this is a Democrat-appointed judge, respectful. Any normal administration, even an opposing one, would consider that to be the end. That's the end of the case. But not the corrupt Biden regime, because they're trying to win the election. And it's very hard to win an election when you're probably, definitely, I would say definitely, the worst president in the history of our country without question. The Sox decision, they call it the Sox decision. Also, I quote, it says, the National Archives and Records Administration, or NARA, very radical left group, by the way, they have the Constitution and the Bill of Rights flagged for being dangerous documents. Did you know that? Does not have the authority to designate materials as presidential records. Now think of that. They don't have the authority. NARA does not have the tapes in question. NARA lacks any right, duty, or means to seize control of those tapes. The president enjoys unconstrained authority to make decisions regarding the disposal of documents. Only the president, not vice presidents, not senators. Biden has a lot of documents from his time as a senator. That's bad. And he has a lot of documents from his time as vice president. That's bad. He has 25 or so times the documents I have. He has so many documents, he doesn't know they're coming. They, they keep them on the floor of his garage where he has that really beautiful Corvette, he says. <laughs> Neither the archivist nor Congress has the authority to veto the president's decision. The president can do whatever he wants with it. And this was a big deal, that act. And it was passed in Congress, 1977. The Presidential Records Act does not confer any mandatory or even discretionary authority on the archivist. They have no say whatsoever to classify records. Under the statute, this responsibility is left solely to the President of the United States. So what the hell are we talking about with this <laughs> phony case? Well, it is true. I mean, it is true, isn't it? In other words, whatever documents a president decides to take with him, he has the absolute right to take them. He has the absolute right to keep them, or he can give them back to NARA if he wants. He talks to them like we were doing, and he can do that if he wants. That's the law, and it couldn't be more clear. Even the New York Times, just to finish up with this hoax, this is the next hoax. We had Russia, Russia, Russia. We had so many hoax. Impeachment hoax number one, impeachment hoax number two. Who the hell else could take this stuff? I had a nice life. I had a nice, easy life. But I'm taking it for you because we're going to make our country great again. We're going to put America first, and we're doing it for you. But even the New York Times in a major article, big article, and they must hate, probably the writer was fired after he said this. But it said headlines, it said that when it comes to asking for documents from former presidents, the only power that NARA has is to say, pretty please. Quote, asking nicely is about all they can do. And yet they reported me to the Department of Justice for criminal prosecution. They don't even have the right to ask. And if they do ask, they have to be very nice. And I don't have to give it. And yet I'm being prosecuted for this. And this is the New York Times saying it. Nothing like this has ever happened before and hopefully will never happen again. 
And we are working all together because we're working as a country. And you know, I'm probably the only person in history in this country that's been indicted and my numbers went up. So true, you see the numbers, we're blowing them all away. It's crazy. Usually when that happens, you announce, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'll be leaving office immediately. And I want to spend more time with my wife and family and fight for my innocence. With me, it's just like crazy. What a life I have. I have a crazy life. But you know what? We became President of the United States, and we together did something that nobody's, when you look at all of the things we did, nobody, Probably nobody has ever done what we did, including rebuilding our military, biggest tax cuts in history, biggest regulatory cuts in history. All of the things that we did, we had no wars. We got out of wars. We beat ISIS. We defeated ISIS. 100 percent defeated ISIS. And got out of wars. And you would have never had Russia go into Ukraine. And you would have never had China you would have never had China talking like they're talking right now about Taiwan. And you'd never have any words coming out of North Korea, Kim Jong-un, like what he's saying about the United States and our president. No, we had a much different time. They respected our country and they respected your president. They really did respect your president. Joe Biden is the most corrupt president in the history of our country by far. Just two days ago, a very respected IRS whistleblower it used to be very much a, you remember when the Democrats used to love whistleblowers? They don't like the whistleblowers now. <laughs> Revealed that Crooked Joe sat in a room while his son Hunter messaged a Chinese Communist Party official and said to this Chinese Party official, I quote, I am sitting here with my father and we would like to understand why the commitment made has not been fulfilled. This is cash he's talking about. Yeah. Tell the director, and it doesn't get reported in the newspapers, tell the director that I would like to resolve this now before it gets out of hand. And now means right now, it means tonight. You believe this? I didn't know he was that tough. <laughs> and if I get a call or a text from anyone involved in this other than you, Zhang or the chairman, I will make certain that between the man sitting next to me, my father, right next to me, Pop, hi, Pop, <laughs> and every person he knows, you will regret not following my direction. Now, can you imagine the newspapers not reporting this? Not a word of it in any of them, in any of them, mainstream. I'm sitting here waiting for the call, he said, with my father. I'm sitting here with my father waiting for the call. In other words, send us money. Within 10 days, the Bidens got $5.1 million from China for absolutely no reason. They got $5.1 million. In fact, they've taken tens of millions of dollars from China. And that's probably why maybe he's not complaining about the fact that they're building military bases in Cuba. Maybe that's the reason, I guess. Mike, what do you think? It's not even believable. This stuff isn't even believable. The worst part of the whole story is that the press doesn't want to report it because you know, there was a time like 15 years ago, 10 years ago, you would have gotten a Pulitzer Prize. Of course, they've been totally discredited because they gave Pulitzer Prizes for the accurate and wonderful reporting on Russia, Russia, Russia. Then it turned out to be a hoax. I said, you have to withdraw the prizes. They said, well, we don't know that and we don't want to do that. We've never done that before. I said, that's OK. Do it or I'm suing you. They said, we're not going to do it. And I sued them. You know, we're in court over that. We want them to return the Pulitzer Prize. And by the way, they're being decimated in courts. Very interesting. But we actually brought a lawsuit against them because they gave Pulitzer Prizes to The New York Times and The Washington Post for their accurate reporting on Russia, Russia, Russia. And even the papers now say it was a hoax. They all say it was a hoax, but they don't want to give back the prizes. So they have to give back those prizes. They will. 
Joe Biden is a totally compromised president because they're bribing him. They're paying him off. They know all the money they've given, and it's far greater than anyone has been able to really understand. And I'll tell you what, Jim Jordan and Jamie Comer and their, their group has done an unbelievable job, but it's far greater than anybody knows. This is just some of the things. It's tens of millions of dollars, and that's just some of it that's been found. And again, the papers aren't reporting, and it's not only China, though. It's many other countries, including Ukraine. So we're giving hundreds of billions of dollars to Ukraine. I keep saying, why isn't Europe paying a like amount? So we're in for 160 billion, and Europe is in for 15 billion. And nobody thinks that's right or fair, and it affects them more than it affects us. These countries know every penny the Biden crime family has taken in. The countries know, Ukraine knows, China knows, they all know, there are many countries. So he can't even or ever go against them. He can't go against them because they'll reveal the corruption because they know exactly. They'll say, well, we sent the check here. We sent the check there. We said, so he has to be very nice to China, has to be very nice to Ukraine. And a huge success will be when the New York Times and the Washington Post and others put it on their front page, what's really happening here, because this is truly 100 times bigger than Watergate. This is a much bigger story than Watergate. That's why Biden doesn't mind that China has opened up these military installations and in the process of building a tremendous amount in Cuba. It's only 90 miles off our coast. He's basically said it's okay. He's not doing anything. He's not even saying anything. He's not talking about it. What that means for our great Cuban population in Miami, I love the Cuban pop population. We got, we got a record. I got a record number of votes. People were very, I got the Bay of Pigs Award. I was given the Bay of Pigs, it was a great honor, award by the Cuban population of Miami. But it means that this group of people in Miami that love Cuba, they want to get back there, they want to see their country, but it means for the rest of their lives, they will never see Cuba again. It's gone, because China is occupying Cuba right now. That means it's gone. And they were getting ready to make a big, if the election wasn't rigged, the Cuban thing would have been taken care of and people could have gone back and forth to Cuba. Cubans, I'm talking about. They could have seen their family. They wouldn't have the problems that they have right now. He's given everything to Cuba and the dictator and dictators. And you know what that was, but we, it's, it's incredible that this can be allowed to happen. So unless I get back in, in which case, I will inform China that they have 48 hours to get any military and spy equipment out of Cuba. Or I will drop the hammer, and there will be tariffs unlike anything that China's ever seen before. And, you know, I took in hundreds of billions of dollars of taxes and tariffs from China. No other president has taken in 10 cents, not 10 cents. Took in hundreds of billions, gave $28 billion to the farmers because they were mistreated by China. <laughs> Who else does that? Who the hell else would do that? You tell me. They know. But he wants to do nothing because he can't. He's really bound to not do anything. Never forget, our enemies want to stop me because I'm the only one who can stop them. And I'm stopping them because of you. I didn't need this. I didn't need it. If these corrupt persecutions succeed, they will complete their takeover of this country and destroy your way of life forever. And that's where it's going. That's where it's going. It's a disgrace. They want to take away my freedom because I will never let them take away your freedom. It's very simple. They want to silence me because I will never let them silence you. And in the end, they're not after me. They're after you. And I just happen to be standing in their way. It's all it is. It's all it is. Very simple, actually. Ultimately, the radical left lunatics are coming after all of us because they know that our allegiance is not to them, our allegiance is to our country and to our Creator. 
And that's why under Biden, Christians are being persecuted like nothing this nation has ever seen before. I don't understand how people can vote. People of faith, and I'm not just talking about Christians, I'm talking about people of faith can vote for these Democrats. They've become monsters. They're fighting you all the way on religion. You know, I watched Biden during debates when he could speak, and he was trying to say, you know, oh, I love being a Catholic. He, you know what they're doing to Catholics right now? There's never been an assault on Catholics the likes of which they're having right now, what they're having to go through. Biden's corrupt DOJ has targeted parents at school board meetings. They've sent SWAT teams to arrest pro-life activists. You know that. The FBI has been caught labeling devout Catholics as domestic terrorists and sending undercover spies into Catholic churches, just as it was in the old Soviet Union days. Pretty rough stuff. Who can believe this? And how can you, as Christians, how can the people in this room vote for them? You know, they get 40 percent, 50 percent, 60 percent of a religious vote. How can they do that? And then they just go about trying to destroy religion. If you look at polls, you'll see religion, people of faith. But religion is going down in terms of importance and popularity. This is not a question of importance and popularity. This is a fact. We love God, and we want to protect ourselves. We want to protect the, the cherished position of believing in God. And I think one of the biggest problems this country has right now is it, as, as religion does go in the wrong direction, because it's something for you to adhere to and to believe in. It's so good. It keeps you sane. It keeps you honest. It keeps you good. It keeps you kind. It makes you help other people. And they're trying to take that away from you. And I just don't understand, where do they get 30, 40, 50, 60 percent of the vote? It just doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. They lie. They lie about their positions. And you have to remember that. In 2024, you have to remember that. Protect your vote is the most important thing. But you have to remember that. And you do have to protect your vote. They want to destroy your religion, along with the fact that they obviously want to destroy your country when you have open borders, when you have no voter ID. Why do they not want voter ID? Because they want to cheat. Even the Democrats voted 82 percent in favor. Democrats, people that vote, Democrats voted 82 percent in favor of voter ID, but the politicians don't want it because they want to cheat. And with voter ID, it's very much harder to cheat. They're mean and they're very, very sick. They are mean and they are very sick. Over the next 16 months, our enemies will try harder than ever to divide us and to destroy us. The lies, abuse, and injustice that will come our way will be worse than ever before in the history of our country. To persevere, we must stand tall. We must stand strong. We have to be strong. We have to be stronger than ever before because they're coming at us. There's something wrong with these people. And I don't like saying that. You know, as president, you're the president of everyone. So I don't like saying that. But there is something wrong with these people. And we have to stand together, or we're not going to have a country anymore. The more they throw at us, the more united we must become. The more vile the attacks, the more relentlessly they go after us. We must keep pushing forward no matter what. You just keep pushing forward. That's what I do. I get up. People say to me, sir, can I ask you a question? How the hell do you take it? I say, do I have a choice? I don't have a choice, right? Do I have a choice? I'd love not to have to, but they're uh, crazy people with there. They're lunatics. I've had the most successful business people in the country come up to me, a man who's one of the most successful. A vicious guy, very tough guy. I don't like him even. He thinks I'm his friend. I'm not, because he's a bad person. <laughs> Unlike Governor Huckabee, who's a good person. He's actually tougher than this guy, but he's also a good person, the governor. But I tell you, he came up to me and he said, could I ask you one question? How do you get up in the morning? Every day, they're coming at you with a different deal. I mean, it started with spying on your campaign. Then it went to the different impeachments and hoaxes and indictments and how do you do it? And I actually said to him, it's like 
it almost becomes a weapon of war. You have to fight these people and you have to beat them. We beat them now for four years and now afterwards. And by the way, if I weren't running right now or if I was losing big in the polls instead of winning by the biggest numbers I've ever had, think of it, the biggest numbers I've ever had, not even close, they would stop in two minutes, I believe. Although maybe the hatred is so great. Actually, Lindsay and Mike, I think the hatred's so great they probably wouldn't stop. I think they would keep going, right? In my case. Normally they would stop, but in my case, I think they'd probably keep on going. <laughs> But if I didn't run, or if I would say, you know, I'm not going to run, or if my numbers were bad, where it looked like I wasn't going to make it, they wouldn't be focusing me. They would focus on whoever was leading, and they would go after that person, male or female, just as viciously as they go after me. And that person would not be able to handle it. That's why you have no choice but to vote for Donald Trump. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Isn't it great? Saturday night, we're here for religion. Is that nice? And what a job Ralph has done. But this isn't my campaign. This is our campaign. This has got to be our campaign. And with your help, we're going to, we're going to see through this whole, we're going to see through it. We're going to take this job right to the finish. And we're going to have a country the likes of which we've never had before, better than ever. We're have it better than ever. No president has ever fought for Christians as hard as I have. And I will keep on fighting and I'll fight hard until I'm back behind that desk in the Oval Office, the Resolute Desk. Resolute Desk. Thank you. Ralph, a question. Were your other candidates treated this way? I don't think so. Actually, I saw one who was booed off the stage. He was booed off. I don't think they were treated. But you know, the greatest honor is in my case, you feel this way because we went through four great years. We did things that nobody thought could be done and we're gonna go into them in a minute, but we did things that nobody thought could be done. So when you do feel this way, I really feel good because that means you accepted and loved what we did in that four years. We did more than probably, and probably any, and many people say this, more than any president, we re rebuilt our military. What we did is so, so incredible. We did it together. I did it because of you. I was helped by you, and we had your support, and it was amazing. So I'm very uh, gratified to get that kind of support, because in my case, it's not just words. You know, when I first came in, I said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to cut taxes, and I'm going to cut regulations, and I'm going to do all these things. And, you know, people would say, yeah, okay, it's just words because it's a politician. All of a sudden, I become a politician. I never had that moniker before, but all of a sudden, I become a politician. But I did all the things, but I actually did much more than I ever promised I'd do. So it makes me feel very good. We totally transformed the federal judiciary, appointing nearly 300 judges a record to interpret the law and the Constitution as written. I withstood vicious attacks to confirm three great Supreme Court justices, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett. And I just hope, because they're under tremendous assault and pressure. I mean, they are. Look, you know what, you see what's going on. In the sports world, they call it playing the ref, you know? They say horrible, horrible things, and 
some people change. A lot of them change, and we can't let that happen. I just hope that these justices, who are brilliant and very good people, I hope they remain strong in the face of the harassment and intimidation that is coming their way and has come their way by the radical left lunatics. I just hope they can withstand it. I hope they don't go to the other side so they feel a little bit better about going out to dinner. That happens so often. With politicians, it happens, but it happens with judges. And we hope that's not going to happen with them or any of our judges. Exactly one year ago today, those justices were the pivotal votes in the Supreme Court's landmark decision ending the constitutional atrocity known as Roe v. Wade. <laughs> Conservatives had been trying for 50 years, exactly 50 years. Amazing that today is the day. I don't know. Did you set this up on purpose? Was that done purposely? <laughs> this is the day, one year. I mean, it's today is the birthday of that decision. Did you do that? I mean, it wasn't just by a fluke, right? I assume you did. Whether you did or not, this is the uh, birthday, so it was pretty good. And Ralph's birthday, too. That was set up, too. That's something, <laughs> something strange is going on here. You know what they'll say? It's Trump's fault. It's Trump's fault. <laughs> but I got it done, and nobody thought it was even a possibility. They've been fighting. Good people, strong people, smart people have been fighting for 50 years, and it never even came close to getting done. I don't believe they've ever even taken a vote. I mean, never even came close. It was something that wasn't going to happen. I got it done. I get a kick out of these candidates and the, even the other side. Well, I don't know. I think I'm more pro-life on this. And and somebody stood up, a woman stood up and said, this guy ended Roe v. Wade. How the hell can you go against him? And I sort of said that myself, actually. <laughs> but I'm proud to be the most pro-life president in American history. Okay. Thank you. From my first day in office, I took historic action to protect the unborn. Very historic. Nobody else did anything near what we did. And it put us in such a great position, that victory. That victory, we'll go into it, but that victory is a tremendous uh, victory in so many different ways because they are the radical people. When they're willing to kill a child, after birth, they're willing. You know, take it beyond the nine months. They are the radical people. They are the people that are really uh, in trouble with the Lord. Yes. I reinstated <laughs> and expanded the Mexico City policy. You know what that is. That was a big deal. Nobody else did it. Stop taxpayer funding for abortion providers. And at the United Nations, I made clear that global bureaucrats have no business attacking the sovereignty of nations that protect innocent life. And I did these things, and I took heat, and I also got great love. I mean, you know, you have two sides to it, but I got great love. And I was the first sitting president ever to attend the March for Life rally right here in Washington, D.C. Under my leadership, we did more to uphold religious freedom than any administration in history by far. I could name some very good presidents that most of the people in this room would like, and they didn't attend the rally, and they didn't do the things we did, like the Mexico City policy. They didn't do anything. And yet, most of the people in this room would like some of the people I would name. But we did it all. We fearlessly protected the conscience, rights of doctors, nurses, teachers, and faith groups like the Little Sisters of the Poor who were treated so badly. We came to their rescue. We stopped the Johnson Amendment from interfering with pastors' free speech under retaliation of terminating tax exemption. 
They really went after people. I was in a room and I said, why don't you speak up more? And uh, I had 50 pastors in the room, two rabbis, 50 pastors. We had a number of religious leaders, heavy on the pastors, I will say that. But they said to me, I said, I want to hear you. They said, we really can't speak because of the Johnson Amendment. This was in 2015, just before I announced. I said, that means that, explain it to me. If we speak out, and if the government wants to, they will take away our tax-exempt status. I said, so you have less power, and you're the people that I want to hear from. You have less power than we were in Trump Tower, 60 stories up, looking down. I said, than any people walking on that sidewalk outside. He said, yes, in many ways we do. We can speak up. And I got it so that the people that we want to hear can now speak up. So that Mike Huck, well, Mike Huckabee spoke up anyway. I don't know. I did, did this have any, I don't think it had much impact on you. It had no impact on Mike. But it had a lot of impact on a lot of other people. And they have been speaking up. And it's important that they do so. I issued guidance making clear that the right to freedom of worship does not end at the door of a public school. Public schools are in tremendous trouble. And I was the first and only president to convene a meeting at the United Nations to end religious persecution worldwide. No other president has ever brought it up. As president, I stood proudly with our friend and ally, the state of Israel. I did more for Israel, they say, than any other president. I kept my promise recognize Israel's eternal capital, Jerusalem, and opened the American embassy in Jerusalem. And I tell the story that sometimes, I don't know, it's maybe more of a good business story, but a general stood before me with something to sign, executive order, because I had won that battle. And it was a bill, essentially, for $2 billion to build an embassy in Jerusalem. And I said, General, what is this for? Sir, this is to build an embassy in Jerusalem. I said, this says $2 billion. How can you spend $2 billion on, like, I, I envisioned it as a one-story building, right? <laughs> Nobody in this room, if you're in the real estate business, would spend quite that much. Maybe it spent, like, $2. But I said, how can, you, how can you ask for $2 billion? Well, that's what they told. By the time you buy the land, sir, and you build the building and everything else, it's going to cost $2 billion. So I called up our ambassador, and I said, uh, David, See if there's something we have there already. We own a lot of land in Jerusalem. Do we have a great piece? And maybe it has like a little building on it where we can fix it up real cheap and we can. <laughs> See, I'll always be in the real estate business, you know? I'll always love that business, and I love that business. We did great at that business. That's a great business, but very creative. And I said, See what you have. They called me back two days later and said, Sir, we have a fantastic site. We've owned it for many, many years. You know, we were there sort of like early on, first. We have a great site, and there's a building on it that's been essentially abandoned, but it's a very strong structure. And we think we could fix it up and get it open very quickly. I said, how does it compare with the site that we're going to buy that they want to buy for a ridiculous amount of money? By the way, that particular person who owned that site is not happy with me, I can tell you. That is not a person. We're going to pay hundreds of millions of dollars for this site. So I said, uh, what do you think of the building? Well, I think we could fix it up. So they called me back a week later. I sent some people over. They said, sir, we can build a new embassy for $400,000. I said, let me ask you a question. It's the only time I ever said this. I said, listen, it sounds too cheap. We got to make it more. No, it actually, it actually sounded, I never did that. Usually I'll say, make it 200,000. I said, we got to make it more. It doesn't sound right. But a friend of mine, in a big building in Manhattan, has beautiful white stone, beige, beautiful beige and white stone opposite his elevator bank. And every time I go into that building, he says, now he says president, but he used to say, Donald, Donald, look at the stone, it's so beautiful. And after saying it to me like 12 times, I said, what is it? He said, it's Jerusalem stone. It's so beautiful, very, very expensive. He's a very rich guy, he talks about the cost of stone, right? That's why he's rich, I guess, right? When you think. <laughs> but he said, he said, it's so beautiful, and I'm so proud of it. Jerusalem stone. So now I'm sitting here talking about building something in Jerusalem, and we're going to do a renovation of an existing building. And I said, listen, can we wrap that building in Jerusalem stone? Is it expensive? He said, absolutely not. We're in Jerusalem. We can buy it for free. 
So the whole building is made out of Jerusalem stone, isn't that correct? Right? Sort of good. A little, little business story. But I did something else, I also, and we got it built. You know, that thing would have never been built, the $2 billion building. It would have been years and years and years. And you might not have, they probably would have ended the whole concept of even moving the embassy to Jerusalem. It would have, so we got it built. And there's no reason to do any better because it's really a beautiful embassy, one of our nicest embassies, I think. But someday they'll come along and say, let's waste billions of dollars and do it the way we originally planned. But. It's a great embassy and was very proud to do it. But we did something else that they weren't even asking for. The most pro-Israel people weren't even asking. I recognized Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights. And that has been going on. And that has been going on for 51 years. They've been trying to get that. People would fly in, fly out. They'd have meetings every two years. People would fly in, talk about it, fly out. I brought some people that truly knew Israel and understand Israel. I said, explain Golan Heights to me. You have five minutes or less. And they did it in about three minutes. But they talked about the importance. They talked about the height, the visibility, the military protection, all of the different things. And I proved it. And nobody even asked for it because they thought that was too far-fetched. But I got Golan Heights approved for Israel. And nobody talks about that one, but that was a big one. And then the biggest of all, but this administration has totally blown it. Uh, I pulled out of the horrible, horrible, one-sided, miserable Iran nuclear deal, which was expiring just about now anyway. And they were ready, had the election gone the way it should have gone, they were ready to make any deal with me. And uh, as you know, I said to China, you can't buy. If you buy, we're not going to do business with you. Okay, we won't buy. No oil from Iran. Nobody was buying oil. They were ready to make a deal. We would have made a great deal for everybody. They would have been Terrific. We all would have, they were dying to make a deal. And then when that tragedy turned out, the world's most corrupt election, when that tragedy turned out, what happened is everybody started buying oil from Iran, and Iran now is very rich. And instead of having a great negotiating position, we have a terrible negotiating position. And they're actually trying to make a deal that was worse than the first one. The first one was horrible. The first one was a short-term deal. I mean, it wasn't like it was for 50 years or 100 years. It would be expiring just about now. So, and that was a license for them to make nuclear weapons. And you cannot let Iran have a nuclear weapon. You cannot let it happen because uh, bad things will happen if that happens. But uh, I got that approved. That was the biggest of all. I was bigger than Jerusalem. That was bigger than the Golan Heights. I always considered that to be the biggest. But unfortunately, they took that, they took that deal and didn't do anything. Iran was making, they were dying to make a deal. And they didn't do anything with it. And then, of course, we did the Abraham Accords, which would have been, I mean, something incredible. <laughs> something incredible. So we took care of Israel like no, no president has ever. In fact, they said, if I ran for prime minister of Israel, I'd get 99% of the votes. I'm thinking about doing that. <laughs> we delivered the largest tax cuts and regulatory cuts or in record in the history of our country. And we built the greatest economy in the history of the world. There's never been an economy like the economy we had. More jobs, more everything than we've ever had before. We achieved energy independence, and we're ready to be energy dominant. We were going to supply oil to all over Europe, everywhere. I was the one that brought up Nord Stream 2. You remember that. I brought, nobody ever heard of Nord Stream 2. I said to Germany, Angela Merkel, I said, you can't make that deal. If you make that deal, that means you're going to be subservient to Russia. She said, no, 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 Donald, this would be wonderful. It didn't turn out to be too good for them. <laughs> then gas prices, when I was in office, reached low numbers like $1.87 a gallon and even less. Think of that. Now they, they go to five, six, seven, eight, nine. It, oh, and it hasn't stopped. Wait till you see what's going to be happening over the next two years. We created the most secure border in U.S. history, built nearly 500 miles of border wall, which was so helpful got Mexico to give us 28,000 soldiers free of charge. I said, look, if you're not going to give them free, I'm going to have to tariff all of the cars that you're building. Because, you know, they took those car, car companies out of Detroit and other places, and they now build 32% of our cars that are built in Mexico. I said, I'm going to put tariffs on if you don't give us the soldiers. And they said, we would love to give you the soldiers. It would be <laughs> 
We had the Remain in Mexico. That's for all the people that are pouring in. And I believe the number is going to be, Lindsay, 15 million people by the end of this year. And they come out of mental institutions. They come out of jails. They come out of insane asylum, which is a stronger word. They said, don't use those words, sir. They're nasty. But insane asylums, very sick people. And they're being, and terrorists, are being poured into our country like never before. And uh, I also terminated the ridiculous catch and release the ridiculous. You catch the people and you release them in our country, okay? Now, well, now with Biden, it, basically that's what they do. But we caught the people and we released them outside of our country. I fully rebuilt the U.S. military, created Space Force, and defeated ISIS and brought our troops back home. You remember during the campaign, during the campaign, do you remember when they said, oh, he's going to bring us into World War III. He's going to bring us in personality type. I said, no, my personality is going to keep you out of World War III. That's what happened. But all of that was only the beginning. And here's just some of the bold agenda that I'll immediately implement when we become the 47th President of the United States. And I'll work with the people here and a lot of other people in Washington right now because I just rode through Washington and it doesn't look like it used to look with me. They have fences around their parks. They have tents up all over the place, tents. It's, this is the capital. This is the most important thing. Think of this, the capital of our country. It's got papers all over the streets. The sidewalks are filthy, dirty. I used to drive by and I'd be screaming over the phone, get those sidewalks clean, get this, get that. <laughs> You got to get the tents down. You can't have the tents. You know, once those tents form, once you leave four or five of them, there was a group of four or five, and I told Secret Service, you got to get over it. We got to take it down immediately, because once that happens, you have 10, then you have 20, then you have hundreds. And what's happened to this city since I've been gone is, oh, it's so sad. It's so dirty and filthy, and people are stopping coming. And that's true in a lot of other cities, too. You look at Chicago. You look at San Francisco, look at New York, what's going on. All Democrat-run, but what's, uh, it was so sad to see. You know, I look forward to coming here, but it was a very sad trip between the airplane and here, because I'm looking at something that I don't even recognize. It's so dirty, and uh, it shouldn't be that way. It's a great, a great place, and it shouldn't be that way. When I get back at the Oval Office, I will totally obliterate the deep state. a deep state. People would say, yeah, I don't know. Now about everybody thinks, yeah, there's a deep state. It's a bad, I call it a bad state. I'll fire the unelected bureaucrats who have weaponized our justice system. And they have weaponized. And we'll create the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to declassify and publish all documents on deep state spying. They spy on so much. Censorship, corruption, including all of that on Christians. The Christians have been under siege under this administration. Just please remember that. Please remember that when they tell you about what, how much they love you. They don't love you at all. They don't love you at all. Never again will federal law enforcement be used to target religious believers. And hopefully never again will it be used to target opponents in an election. Because that's what they're doing. Americans of faith are not a threat to our country. Americans of faith are the soul of our country. And when I'm back in the White House, I will once again appoint rock-solid conservative judges and mold the mold of justices like Antonin Scalia and the great Clarence Thomas, who is, who really they are going after right now very unfairly. Read that story very unfairly. And before Election Day 2024, I will again release the full list of names from which I will select my appointments to the United States Supreme Court. I did that last time, and it had a big impact. To stop the Marxist pro and they are indeed Marxist, or worse, fascist Marxist. Prosecutors who release rapists and murderers while persecuting conservatives and people of religion, I will direct a completely overhauled 
DOJ to investigate every radical DA in America, AG in America for their illegal racist and reverse enforcement of the law. These are bad people. And they're being run by the DOJ, just in case you have any questions. You know, in New York, where they go after me, never had a problem. All of a sudden, I got, this, I got a DA who's after me. Uh, brag. But you know what they did? They put people from the DOJ into the DA's office. Can you believe it? I don't even think that's legal, they say. But I have, D I have DOJ prosecutors in there telling them how to go about it. But they haven't done a very good job because they have no case. To deter illegal immigration coming from jails and these mental institutions that I've told you about, all of the terrorists we're infiltrating, and they're infiltrating our country like never before in the history of our country. I don't think any country in the world has gone through this. And I always say, even a third world country wouldn't allow people in like this. They would stand there with sticks and stones. They wouldn't allow it to happen. One thing, nobody's been able to tell me why this is a good thing. Why is it a good thing? It's not good politically. Now, they all say, oh, no, they'll go and they'll vote. Well, first of all, we're doing very well with Hispanics, and large numbers are Hispanics. But, but you know, even more so, they don't need people because they cheat so much in the voting they don't need. But if you think about their policies, open borders, high taxes, high interest rates, no voter ID, uh, bad military, woke military, all these things, you can't win on policy unless you cheat. Just think about it. How can you win on any of those things? Does anybody really, I don't care, give me a, the most liberal person, does anybody who's liberal or anything else want people to march and steam into our country and just come into our country? We have no checks, no balances. We have no idea who they are. And they do. They come from prisons and mental institutions, many of them. The mental institutions and the prisons and countries all over the world are being emptied out into the United States of America right now. Now, how the hell is that good politics? I don't understand it. And yet, they get votes. They get votes. Somebody someday will explain it, or maybe people just don't know. That's why I say it as many times as I can, because nobody can want that to happen. I've already announced that I will sign on day one an executive order ending automatic citizenship for the children of illegal aliens. You have to do that. We're the only country in the world that does it. If you literally set a foot in the sand across the border, your child is called welcome to being an American citizen. It's so unfair to our country. In addition, here are some of the other actions I'll take to restore the border of the United States and to make it safe again. We had the most successful and strongest border in American history. And to get it back, I will immediately reinstate all of the incredibly successful border policies of the Trump administration including our safe third agreements, which you know what that means. Remain in Mexico, that's pretty obvious what that means. Our asylum bans, we didn't let a lot of bad people in. Uh, we will complete even more border wall. We built the border wall, and then we were going to add another 200 miles. And that's what I knew they actually wanted, because uh, in three weeks, they could have had it completed. And they not only didn't complete it, they took the gates, the fences, and the walls and they moved it to other parts of the country so that nobody could get to it. And I said, you know, they must really want to have open borders because we added in certain areas, it's a little like water coming through, right? Then you have certain areas that you learn when the wall is up. So we were closing up those areas would have been just incredible. And they didn't want that to happen. They actually took it. Texas wanted to buy it from the federal government. They said, we don't sell it. We wouldn't sell it to you under any circumstances. So that's when I realized for the first time that they were actually serious, that they want totally open borders, which is absolutely insane. And uh, we're going to restore the prosecution policy, which saw a record number of prosecutions of illegal aliens who had to leave the country. We had to get them out. Sometimes they were so evil, so bad, that would put them in prisons in our own country because they have a tendency to come back. But they weren't able to come back because we had a very strong border. Uh, drugs now are, are, think of this number. We did very well on drugs. Not well enough, by the way. No, nobody does well enough until they're gone because I believe we're going to lose 350,000 people this year and destroy families all over our country. It's like an invasion. 
But drugs now are 12 times higher than they were just two and a half, three years ago. 12 times higher. They're pouring in. Fentanyl is pouring in. President Xi and I had a deal. He was going to make it criminal to make fentanyl in China. There'd be no more fentanyl coming from China. When I didn't win the election, meaning I won it, but when it was rigged, when the election took place, he said, well, I don't have to go by that deal anymore. He didn't want that deal. But it's made much of it in China, and it flows through the border. We want people to come into our country, but we want them to come into our country legally. We want people to come in. We want them to come in le legally. And furthermore, I'll fully implement Title 42 across the entire southern border based on all of the diseases that illegal aliens are bringing in. It's unbelievable that they, even the judge in the case said, do you know what you're doing? Because the Biden administration wanted it terminated. And the judge wouldn't do it, but it terminated itself. Judge can't do anything about that. Judge said, you know what you're doing by asking for this? And we will have to do rapid deportation of all of these border crosses. But we have people that are very seriously ill with contagious diseases, and they're pouring into our country along with all of the rest. We have no idea who these people are. Nobody cares. Nobody cares on the other side. They can just come in. A friend of mine called. He said, how do I go about becoming a citizen? Do I take classes? I say, well, don't say I said it. But if you happen to walk down to the border, just walk across and you'll be fine. <laughs> You know, it takes some people 10, 12 years. They go take tests. It's a beautiful thing to watch. And they love the country so much, and yet others just walk across the border. I'll also use Title 42 to end the child trafficking crisis by returning all trafficked children to their families in their home countries immediately. Horrible. Horrible. And I'll shift massive portions of the existing federal law enforcement apparatus to immigration enforcement, including parts of the DEA, ATF, FBI, and Homeland Security investigators. We're going to move them around. I will issue a policy directive making clear that a core national defense mission is to protect American sovereignty, and therefore, we must use any and all resources necessary to stop this incredible incredible invasion. It's an invasion, including moving thousands of troops currently stationed overseas and elsewhere to our own southern border. <laughs> Following the Eisenhower model, I don't know if you know this, but Eisenhower was very strong on the border. We will carry out the largest domestic deportation operation in American history. And we're going to get the bad ones out quickly. We've got a lot of real bad ones. You know, these countries are very smart. I got to know all of the heads of the countries. They're very smart, very streetwise. And they don't let their good people come. They send the people in the caravans that they don't want. Even if they're not officially criminals, if they're not officially, you know, bad people, as we say, or people with serious medical problems, they want their people to stay in their countries. They don't want them to leave. And they send and they organize many of the caravans. The people. The heads of the countries organize these caravans, and they come right into the United States now. We stopped them. We stopped them cold, but they come right into the United States now. I will invoke the Alien Enemies Act, something people didn't even know we had, to remove all known or suspected gang members, drug dealers, or cartel members from the United States, ending the scourge of illegal alien gang violence once and for all. We were very tough on MS-13, the gang members. We were very, they don't like me at all. They don't like me too much. We will destroy the cartels, including by deploying U.S. Navy to impose a full naval embargo to close the waters of our region because the land will be closed up. And to all smugglers and traffickers. And you know, they traffic mostly in women, just in case you didn't know that. It's mostly women, not children, not men. It's mostly in women. It's a horrible thing. It sounds like almost a prehistoric thing, but it's not. It's very modern. And what's made it so bad is the internet. It's like a big, big, huge business, but they traffic mostly in women. During my administration, we also took extraordinary steps to improve vetting for legal entry to keep criminals, thugs, and terrorists the hell out of our country. We strengthened the citizenship test by a lot. We stripped citizenship from those who threatened our security as a nation. We did social media vetting and created the first ever national vetting center. It's very successful. 
We found laws that had never been used before, and we use them now because not easy to go through Congress, but there are so many laws. We used many of them and very successful, including the right to tariff by the president. Because again, China paid us and other countries paid us hundreds of billions of dollars, and it saved our businesses too, made them competitive. Today, I'm announcing a new plan to protect the integrity of our immigration system. Federal law prohibits the entry of communists and totalitarians into the United States. But my question is, what do we do with the ones that are already here that grew up in it? I think we have to pass a new law for them. Using federal law in Section 212F, of the Immigration and Nationality Act, I will order my government to deny entry to all communists and all Marxists. Those who come to and join our country must love our country. We want them to love our country. We don't want them when they want to destroy our country. Welcome to America. We want to destroy your country. Thank you very much. So we're going to keep foreign, Christian-hating, communists, Marxists, and socialists out of America. We're keeping them out of America. When I was president, the world was stable and calm because America was respected and strong. Now, as we see in Russia and all of these other places, this whole world is on fire. This world is on fire. Before I even arrive at the Oval Office, I will have the horrible war between Russia and Ukraine totally settled. I'll have it done in 24 hours. I say that, and I would do that. That's easy compared to some of the things. But I'd get that done in 24 hours. I know them both. I know them both. As the Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers. See that? I will be your... And I will be your peacemaker. I was your peacemaker. Oh, that's great. Blessed are the peacemakers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. But it's so true, the peacemakers. I will stop Joe Biden's inflation nightmare, save the U.S. economy, and I will always protect Medicare and Social Security, which for some very bad politicians, it's under siege. I don't know if you know that. It's under siege by people that tried to do it before. I won't mention names. As your president, I will continue to stand proudly for pro-life policies, just as I did for four strong years. And we cannot, in this room, and Republicans, but the people in this room, we cannot be afraid to take on the Democrat extremists. We can't be afraid. We have to be strong and powerful. That's why, when I'm reelected, I will continue to fight against the demented late-term abortionists in the Democrat Party who believe in unlimited abortion on demand and even executing babies after birth. These are very troubled people, and the American public is on our side by overwhelming margins. You know, the politicians are going to have to learn to talk about this issue because they are the radicals. We're not the radicals. When you kill a baby after four months, six months, eight months, nine months, remember the governor of Virginia? He said, yes, the baby is born. You lay the baby aside, and then you make a determination as to what you do with the babies. In other words, he would kill the baby after, and you have many. They believe in that. They, that's what they want. They are the radical extremists. We're not the radical extremists. And politicians have to say that. They have to say that because they come out as radical. And the Democrats that believe in this late-term abortion, thanks to the Supreme Court decision of exactly one year ago. We gave those who 
have long been fighting for pro-life cause, negotiating power for the first time ever. You have tremendous negotiating power. Now, with Roe v. Wade, you had none. You had no power. We've now given pro-life people tremendous power to negotiate something that will be happy, that will be good for everybody. And you have power for the first time. You didn't have that power. You had no power. They could do anything. They could kill the baby after the baby was born. They could kill the baby in the ninth month. These are horrible, horrible things to think about. And even other countries, other than two countries, I won't mention their names. China <laughs> and North Korea. They have very strong limits. But I believe the greatest progress for pro-life is now being made in the states where everyone wanted to be. That's one, one of the reasons they wanted Roe v. Wade terminated, is to bring it back into the states where a lot of people feel strongly it should be, and where legal scholars feel very strongly it should be, with the three exceptions that I support and Ronald Reagan before me supported for rape, incest, and for the life of the mother. A lot of people are, are more and more coming into that fold, and uh, it's something you have to very consider. You have to go with your heart. You have to go with your mind. You have to make that decision, but the three exceptions. And Ronald Reagan was uh, there a long time ago, and I got through two very successful campaigns. Actually, my second campaign was much more successful. I got 12 million more votes, so I don't know. I wonder what happened. I wonder what happened. However, there, of course, remains a vital role for the federal government in protecting unborn life. And it's very important, and I propose for you tonight, just uh, as I did when I said that we will win the Supreme Court decision on abortion. Remember I said that during my campaign? Everyone said, that's not going to happen. Nobody thought that was going to happen, but I will fight for you like no president has ever fought before. We'll get something done for the country. We're going to be for the country. We will defeat the radical Democrat policy of extreme late-term abortion, and we will bring everybody together to protect our precious unborn babies in a very, very big way. And now you have the power to do it because we terminated Roe v. Wade. Every child born and unborn is a sacred gift from God. Thank you. Thank you. But you're in a much different position than you were before. Before, you had, you had nothing to negotiate with. Today, you're, uh, you're in the driver's seat, very much in the driver's seat. Under my leadership, the United States will also rejoin the Geneva Consensus Declaration created by my administration and signed by 36 nations to reject the globalist claim of an international right to abortion. This declaration affirms the family as the foundation of a good and great society and states that every human being has the inherent right to life. And Joe Biden withdrew the United States from this historic declaration his very first week in office, as he did so much else. They ended Anwar, the biggest drilling site in the world, probably larger than probably larger than Saudi Arabia, if you can believe it. This was in Alaska. Ronald Reagan couldn't get it done. Nobody could get it done. I got it done. And in the first week in office, he terminated Anwar. Would have been unbelievable, would have been great, but we'll bring it back. We'll bring it back. So many different things they terminated. But some things they couldn't terminate, like the tax cuts. They have never been able to do that. A lot of the regulation cuts that created all those jobs, they're having a hard time with that. But I'll return us to where we were right on day one. We're going to be returning our country very quickly. It's going to happen very fast. We know the right people. You know, I went through a lot of people. Some were fantastic. They were great. And some weren't good. But I came here, and I was only in Washington 17 times during my entire life. I read this in an article, so I assume it's true. Of course, it was written, <laughs> it was written by a group that I'm not a big believer. But they said 17 times. I never stayed over. And I wasn't a part of Washington society, so I had to rely on people for recommendations. And many of them were good. Look, we rebuilt our military. We did so many incredible things, the tax cuts, the regulation cuts. We had great people, but we had some people that uh, I wouldn't have chosen if given a second shot. We had weak people. We had stupid people. We had people. 
that had no leadership ability. We had some very bad people. We had some very great people that I'd use again in a heartbeat. Look, look at all the things we did. We did that because of great people. But now I know everybody. I know people. I don't have to rely on some rhino saying, why don't you give us this one to head intelligence? How about this guy to head intelligence, sir? You know, you had to rely on some rhinos that you don't want to rely on anymore. But you really learn. And you have to learn fast if you got some problems. But as we continue to fight for the unborn, and conservatives also have a duty to support the loving choice of adoption, including faith-based adoption. That's why, as part of extending the Trump tax cuts, you know, we're going to have to, the time is coming up, we're going to have to extend that. I will ask Congress to expand the adoption tax credit. We'll do that, because a lot of people have been adopting, and that's a great thing. Another top priority will be to expel the communists and these terrible people that have taken over our education system, when you look. I will immediately sign a new executive order to cut federal funding for any school pushing critical race theory, transgender insanity, and other inappropriate racial, sexual, or political content on our children. Can you believe this? Can you imagine saying this 10 or 15 years ago? I will fight for parents' rights. Of course you fight for Today I have to say, I have to make it, I will fight for parents' rights. Of course you fight for parents' rights. Who would ever think you have to say that as a politician or as a person at a microphone? Including the right to send your child to the public, private, charter, or religious school of your choice. At the same time, I refuse to abandon our public school system to these lunatics, because what's happening there is terrible. That's why I will fight for the direct election of school principals by the parents, the parents of the school. If any principal is not getting the job done, the parents should be able to vote to fire them immediately and to select someone who will. And I will not give one penny to any school that has a vaccine mandate or mask mandate from kindergarten to college. And something else I find hard to believe that I have to even say, it's so ridiculous. It's so horrible and so ridiculous. I will keep men out of women's sports. So, so horrible. And I will sign a law prohibiting child sexual mutilation in all 50 states. Prohibited. State the Trump ban on transgenders in the military. We had it ban. Because our warriors should be focused on crushing American enemies, on being strong, on having the image of being strong. They have to be powerful, they have to be strong, especially when you see what's happening in the world today, not catering to radical gender ideology. So you know I had this in the military. And a lot of the generals that I dealt with, the real generals, the good ones, the generals that weren't involved in the worst, most embarrassing day of our lives as a country, and that was the removal of our military from Afghanistan before our American citizens were taken out, before our soldiers were protected, leaving 85 Billion dollars worth of brand new Trump equipment. I bought it all brand new, beautiful. New tanks, new planes. 70, think of this, 70,000 vehicles. Some of them, many of them armor-plated, costing 
hundreds of thousands of dollars and even million dollars each, 700,000 rifles, guns, and that type of equipment. And now Afghanistan is the second or third largest seller of military equipment in the world because they don't need 700,000 rifles, do they? The best equipment, the finest equipment, the night goggles that they have are better than ours, brand new, not even taken out of the box. Now they fight at night because they never did. They, could, they couldn't see, now they see very nicely. <laughs> but as you know, in the military, you're not allowed to take virtually any drugs. You're not allowed to take drugs. You take an aspirin, you have a problem. And to have this operation, you have massive amounts of drugs required on a daily basis. Massive, massive amounts of drugs. Furthermore, I will ban all taxpayer funding for sex or gender transitions at any age. And just as I've done for four years, I will fully uphold our Second Amendment. We need our Second Amendment. I will bring back free speech in America. And finally, to restore pride in our history and confidence in our future, I will lead a massive year-long salute to America to celebrate the 250th anniversary on July 4th. This was July 4th, 1776, okay? There are other dates you hear about, but this is the date that we recognize, 1776. And we're going to have a big celebration, and it's going to be a celebration like we really deserve in this country for everything we've gone through. With you at my side, we will give our nation's founding the amazing anniversary party that America needs and so richly deserves. Days from now, all of us will be celebrating this year's Independence Day at a very challenging time for our country. As we do, let us remember the words of one Massachusetts preacher during the Revolutionary War on an autumn night in 1777, when the fate of our nation looked very, very bleak, much as it does in many ways right now. Be of good courage, he urged the patriots in the pews, because the cause of American independence is a glorious, glorious cause. Today, we are a nation in decline, and it is because of our corrupt and inept leadership and the power of modern-day weaponry. It's so powerful, so horrible. It's so horrible. The levels of power, you've never seen anything like it. Shouldn't even be discussed. It wasn't talked about very much during my term. I didn't want to have anyone talking about it, but the level of power of modern-day weaponry is, is horrible. It's the most dangerous period in the history of our country. It's time for us, because of all of this, so scary, we have leaders that don't have a clue. We have leaders that have no idea what they're doing. They have no idea. We have leaders that are totally corrupt. These are corrupt people. It's time for us to keep our faith, our unity, and our resolve. We must be strong like never before. We must be unstoppable. Together, we will take on the communists and the Marxists and the fascists and the globalists and the fake news media, which is just as bad as all of them. And we have to take on crooked Joe Biden and the worst administration in the history of this country. And propelled by the spirit of July 4th, 1776, we will win a righteous and resounding victory on November 5th, 2024, and we will make America great again, greater than ever before. Thank you all very much. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you.
feel 